Okay. So when the index is finite. So it's basically the group of integer matrices inside of such a Lie group. And uh, it's called arithmetic when this thing happens. And it's called a fin group uh, when the index is infinite. So this is the notion of uh, introduced by Sarnak of fin groups. So this is what uh, usually he thinks about when he talks about fin groups. And um, examples. <coughs> As I told you today, I'm going to talk about very very easy groups. So if you take G equal SL to R, <coughs> then uh, the group generated by the matrices 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 2, 1. So this group here is arithmetic. So actually, these are the generators of the uh, principal congruence group of level 2 of uh, C2Z. So the matrices which are identity mod 2. And so he's the, he, this thing has index uh, 6. <coughs> and uh, uh, if you change slightly the coefficients, then this is fin. So it's still a risky dance, but uh, thanks to Fustenberg. But it's a fin group. And both of them are free groups. Uh, yeah, yeah, both of them are free groups, yeah. Precisely. That, that will be important in a moment, I mean, this discussion about fin groups and the. Uh, but let me start slowly, especially because, I mean, it's, for me, it's late in the night, <laughs> because I like to wake up early in the morning. So, Motiv so let me talk about some motivation. So basically, uh, <clears throat> for a long time, I was not paying too much attention to this question of uh, fin groups, to be honest, uh, because I was thinking that uh, the risky denseness was already sufficient for many purposes in dynamics. For instance, there is the whole bunch of works by Godshad Margulis and uh, Giva Shoji telling that uh, if you do dynamics, then knowing that uh, your group is a risky dense gives you many information about dynamical quantities like the upon of exponents. And uh, for a long time, I was thinking that, well, the risk denseness suffices for many things. But actually, this is not quite true. So <clears throat> in number theory, and this is the main motivation of Sarnak, in number theory, Uh, uh, the nature of gamma matters uh, in uh, sieving questions. So when you are trying to do the analog of Aristotle and sieving procedure, when you are trying to detect primes and things like that, Actually, when you're looking at orbits of this group, if this group is arithmetic, it's much easier to do C theory for these guys to count orbits, when, rather than it with, when it's thin. And uh, the, key, the, the basic idea here, so basic idea, <coughs> is that if you are arithmetic, then you are so close to the case of this standard lattice that you can apply many tools like uh, cash down property T and things like that. And if you are thin, then the problems become more and more complicated depending on the house of dimension of the limit set. So if the house of dimension of the limit set, I'm not going to define this thing, but for those who know these words, it makes some sense, I guess. House of dimension of limit set. <clears throat> so basically, depending on the limit set of this group, uh, if it's uh, the dimension is not very small, then you can still pretend that it, you can apply this kind of tools. But if it's really tiny, then you start having problems. And so, of course, uh, you can find more details about these things in the works of uh, Burgan, Sarnak, and the uh, co-authors. <coughs> I recommend uh, looking at these papers of Burgan, Sarnak, etc., containing these words, fin groups, and the uh, limit sets. 
So this is the motivation uh, from someone coming from um, number theory. Actually, from someone coming from dynamics, it's not natural to, to think about this finesse question because actually I was surprised recently. So uh, arithmeticity, arithmeticity is a precious information. So the, the example that I have in mind here is the following. So uh, there is a recent uh, work by uh, Rodolfo Gutierrez Homo. Uh, proved the arithmeticity of uh, what people call Rosevich groups, so which are basically the concept of monodromies for a certain measure. <clears throat> and so, uh, out of this proof, I mean, by, by trying to prove arithmeticity, he got new tools which allowed him to establish uh, many things, including uh, simplicity of Lyapunov exponents <coughs> for uh, quality differentials for some cases, some instances of quality differentials. And which was a problem which was open since the works of uh, Avila and Vienna in 2007. So basically, there, there was a work by Avila and Vienna in 2007 in the case of Abelian, what people call Abelian differentials, which solved the, the famous conjecture of uh, Zorich and Konsevich. And uh, basically, the analog of this result of Avila Vienna for quality differentials was open until recently. And actually, it was by developing tools to prove arithmeticity that Rodolfo could uh, break through the problem. So actually, fighting for arithmeticity is a good idea. So even if you don't care initially, like I was not caring too much. Well, I should not say that because it's getting recorded. And, uh, <laughs> but um, well, now, now I care about this problem. So I think it's OK. <coughs> yeah, so e even if you don't care too much about arithmeticity and you are usually happy with service denseness, Trying to fight for arithmeticity sometimes gives you tools for attacking other problems. And so it's funny. So let's see. Um, yeah, so let's see what happens in the context of uh, this translation surface. So <clears throat> actually, Sarnak's question, I mean, he introduced this definition. And after the definition, he posed the question, so how often are uh, gammas thin? So of course, this is a broad question. I mean, uh, there are many contexts. So it depends, of course, on the context. And uh, so let me quote some results. So there is a result by uh, Elena Fuchs and Igor Rivin saying the following, that uh, for most choices of A and B in S, L, and Z, um, the group generated by those guys is thin. So for random, I mean, there is a you you should be careful about this thing. I mean, depending on how you set up the word most, the theorem works or not. But uh, they have a natural definition using uh, combinatorial balls, allowing to show that most choices lead to thin groups. <coughs> um, on the other hand, if you like. Uh, a little bit of algebraic geometry, then uh, Vinka, Taramana, and uh, Singh, and Brav, and Thomas, and many other persons. I mean, more recently, Philip, uh, Daniel de Juan, and people like that were studying the case of uh, uh, variations. So actually, uh, there are 14 examples. 14 examples of uh, <coughs> families of threefold calabials uh, parametrized by P1 minus three points. 
that are from <coughs> coming from hyper uh, geometric equations. And actually, for these examples, you have some monodromy corresponding to what you see when you move the Hodge structure along uh, these cusps. And then this gives you matrices in SP4. And so basically what the, those guys proved is that for uh, seven cases, the monodromy, monodromy representation is arithmetic. And for the seven other, uh, monodromy is fin. So depending on the context, fin is not so uh, dominant. I mean, it's half, half. And uh, in this random case, it's fin wins with high probability. So you see that the, the final answer to solve a question is sensitive to the context. And so today I'm going to study another context. So actually, Sarnak asked, uh, I mean, Alex Eskin, and then Alex Eskin transferred the question to me at some point, and then uh, started to look at this question. So basically, Sarnak was also, I mean, he, he's uh, really uh, fascinated by these fin groups stuff. And so he's, uh, I think he's right now trying to collect all occurrences of fin groups in nature. So basically, he's interested I mean, in everybody which can produce his families of other fin groups or arithmetic groups. <coughs> and so he was asking, to Alex asking, uh, whether these fin groups appear in the context of translation surface in the conservatorical cycle. And so this is what I'm going to talk now. So Sarnak's question. So now I'm going to talk about Sarnak's question. Uh, initially to asking. Uh, how frequently? Uh, R KZ, so KZ for conservatorical cycle, monodromies. <coughs> and of course, I mean, this is again a broad question. I mean, there are many contexts you can put this question. And uh, for today, it'll be very, very concrete. So from now on, from now on, if you wish, you can forget about what I just said. I'm going to restart a new talk. So I'm going to talk about the context of a uh, square tile surface. So I'm going to try to answer. I mean, try to say something about this question in the context of square tile surfaces. So for that, I need to recall you what the square tile surface is. So square tile surfaces are pairs of Riemann surfaces and abelian differentials, uh, which are obtained by uh, branched covers of the torus. So you think of the torus as the usual square elliptic curve. <coughs> uh, on this thing, you have a, a finite uh, branched cover uh, branching only at uh, the origin. <coughs> and then uh, you take this finite cover and then you pull back the human surface structure and pull back the DZ4. And so this is a square tile surface. So concretely, what you are trying to do is you are trying to pick a finite number of squares. And they are trying to glue sides by translations. You give some recipe to glue, to glue parallel sides by translations. So this is why square tile surfaces are a particular case of what people call translation surfaces. <coughs> okay, so this is uh, an example. So this is a threefold cover of the usual square of the usual torus. <coughs> and these are the objects I'm, I'm interested in today. Um, okay, so I, I managed to talk about the objects. Um, <clears throat> so actually, these objects are <clears throat> usually higher genus. So in this case, these are Riemann surface of genus two. <clears throat> Why? Because uh, I mean, these forms here usually have zeros over the fiber of zero under pi. 
So this means at the corners. <coughs> at the corners of these squares, usually there are zeros. And actually, you can apply him on how to recover the genus from, I mean, 2D minus 2 is the sum of orders of zeros of omega. And if you do this calculation, this example, you find genus 2. There is only one guy. <coughs> OK. So these are things of higher genus in general. And uh, these are particular cases, so square tile surfaces. are particular examples of translation surfaces. So surfaces where you glue, where you have polygons, <coughs> and you glue parallel sides by translations. And the nice thing about this uh, interpretation in terms of squares is that you see right away from this definition that there is an action of uh, SHR. Action of SHR. <clears throat> so how does SHR act? Simply by you look at this picture, you take a matrix and you apply this matrix to the to the picture. I don't know if the if the matrix is one one zero one then you get something like that, right? I mean, my, my drawings are bad, but uh, you get the idea. <clears throat> of course, uh, I'm not going to talk about square tile surface by themselves, but I want to put them on some moduli space. So square tile surfaces. So let me simplify and call square tile surface origamis. So this is the usual strategy that people uh, use during lectures. So. It's easier to write origamis than square tile surface. <laughs> so origamis live in a moduli space. So what I mean by that is I'm not going to take polygons by themselves, but rather I'm allowing to identify two such objects if I can deduce one from the other by cutting and pasting by translations. So in particular, if I do this thing here, uh, if I apply this matrix, to the torus, I see that uh, the torus gets slanted. But then I can cut here and paste there, respecting the identifications, to recover the same torus, just by translation. So what I'm saying is that this torus here and this torus are the same in moduli space. <coughs> OK, so you have a, a, a nice moduli space. And you have an action of SL2R. <coughs> and actually, <coughs> in general, when you apply a, a, a random matrix in SL2R, you don't get a square tile surface. But the remark is that uh, SL2R uh, Z respects the subset of uh, origamis. Why? Uh, because SL2Z is generated by these two unipotent matrix, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 1, 1. And both of them uh, preserve the torus. So if you apply them, you still have this uh, branched cover to the torus. So there is still square tile. <coughs> And so, actually, what you can ask, so definition, there is a very nice notion which was introduced by Vich, which is the Vich group. So the Vich group, Vich group of M omega, of a square tile surface, is uh, SLM omega, which is the stabilizer of M omega in SL2Z. So take all matrices in SL2Z which stabilize your origami. So example, the Vich group of uh, the torus is SL2Z. 
And because uh, I mean, I just proved that one of the generators stabilize, and the other one can do the similar exercise. <coughs> okay, so this is the uh, which group, which will be important for us in a moment. Um, so uh, actually, right now, so let me <laughs> explain why these things is important. So this thing is important because of the following. Uh, actually, you can see that uh, if you give me uh, 100 squares, the number of square tile surfaces that I can produce with 100 squares is finite. And in particular, uh, you can see also that uh, this action of SL2Z does not change the number of squares. And so uh, this means that SL2Z is always acting on a finite set of uh, guys. And so you can use that to show that uh, SL2, the Vich group has finite index in SL2Z. Okay? And so this means, in particular, that when you try to use SL2, SL2R to move your square tile surface in the model space, so here's the picture. You have SL2R applied to this guy in model space. <coughs> and uh, there is the usual principle that, I mean, if you want to get an orbit of an action, you have the group over the stabilizer. So this is the group over the stabilizer. And so this is actually the cotangent unit cotangent bundle to this hyperbolic surface where SL2R acts by maybe transformations. And this is a finite cover of SL2R over SL2Z, which is also known as the modular curve. <coughs> so basically what I'm saying is the following. If you follow this uh, scheme, you see that there is this modular space of all possible transition surface. And inside this guy, you have a nice uh, Riemann surface sitting in. I mean, not a Riemann surface, it's the unit cotangent bundle, but usually people refer to this object here as a Tachmiller curve. Why curve? I mean, because this is a Riemann surface model, sitting in modular space. So there is some object which is usually not compact. I mean, it's finite area because this thing is finite area, but it's not compact. So there is some, a certain number of cusps, maybe some gen genus. And so this is the picture of uh, H modulo SL uh, M omega. And on this thing, you have a geodesic flow. Uh, geodesic flow which in this coordinate is just multiplying the matrix on this side by exponential t, exponential minus t. It's the diagonal matrix on the Poincare plane, uh, half plane. And so this flow here is just taking a point and then looking at some direction with some unit tangent vector and flowing along this hyperbolic surface. And as people uh, in Russia know very well, uh, yeah, my drawing is not very good, but uh, I would like to show a recurrent point, so it's hard. So I'm going to. <laughs> and then what I'm planning to say is the following. If you run this geodesic flow for a long time at a random direction, then uh, you are going to get back close to yourself infinitely many times. You can, at this point, close up this orbit. And then you get a closed loop on this hyperbolic surface, so some free homotopy class. And now uh, comes the notion of, uh, I mean, Gauss-Money connection or concept zorich cycle. What you can do is the following. You can remember that this is a surface. So this is a curve sitting in a modular space. And this, I mean, it's a modular space, so it's parametrizing something. What, what is parametrizing? Surfaces. And surfaces have uh, homology groups. So what you can do is you can, over each point, which is a surface, put a copy of its first homology group. And then you can do parallel transport for the Gauss money and get back. 
And if you do that, you get a matrix, which is what people call, I mean, a uh, conservatory matrix. So the conservatory core cycle is the uh, extension of uh, the geodesic flow on uh, this uh, surface of the unit tangent bundle. Uh, to uh, the Hodge bundle. So Hodge bundle is exactly this procedure that I told you, that uh, you take the vector bundle, which consists of looking at each point, a copy of the homology. Uh, so you extend this to the Hodge bundle via a parallel transport under Gauss-Money connection. So this is the fancy way of phrasing this. I'm going to give a concrete way of computing this matrix. So I think it's time to, I, I do some calculation. I mean, I, I'm a very concrete person. So uh, I mean, I can understand a sophisticated phrase like that if you give me some time. But uh, I prefer first to understand things on concrete examples. So let me uh, do a, one calculation. So let me pick this L. example with three squares. So on the surface, you have a basis of homology consisting of these two curves. Yes, I actually. <coughs> so I should orient them, I mean, vertically and horizontally. So this is a, a basis of homology. I mean, uh, the surface has genus 2, so homology has dimension 2 times g. So it should give me four cycles. This is correct. There are four cycles. And now you can apply the matrix, which is 1, 2, 0, 1. OK? Why I'm doing that? Because I know in advance that this matrix belongs to the Vich group. It's stabilizing. So if you do that, actually, you are going to uh, do the following. I mean, uh, this uh, part of the cylinder gets here, so you get something very tilted like that. And then, I mean, on the top of that, you get another thing which is very uh, twisted, like that. And if you cut and paste several times, uh, you can do the exercise and check that uh, uh, you can recover uh, this surface by cutting and pasting. But of course, when you do that, cut and paste, you are changing the names of these curves. And how are you changing? Well, uh, this matrix here, A, uh, since it's uh, uh, horizontal, it fixes the horizontal, the cycle sigma 0 and sigma 1 don't change. And the cycle zeta 0 and zeta 1, actually zeta 0, it moves to this side until it gets a full turn. So you add sigma 1. And for this curve, you cross this one first. So you do sigma 1. And then this guy here got twisted twice, so you get twice sigma 0. So these are computations in homology. <clears throat> and so this is the matrix that I was telling you about. There is a four-dimensional vector space here, which is the homology. And when you go around this matrix here and you get back, what you see is precisely this modification in homology. <clears throat> Very nice. Um, now, <coughs> There are two things that I need to tell you about. So the first thing is that uh, the homology, I mean, um, how do you recall? So the homology of uh, the surface is a symplectic vector space. Of dimension 2G. So symplectic uh, with respect to the intersection form. In other words, you look at curves in the surface, you count how much intersection you see. Ori oriented intersection, plus minus. <coughs> and so this means the following, that uh, if you look at this Vich group, uh, and you look at this process of uh, using these elements to go around 
this surface, you get a representation. There is a representation, so Konsevich Zorich monodromy. So I'm going to define the monodromy. <coughs> Which consists of taking an element of the Fitch group and associating to the matrix that you see. So which is a, an endomorphism of H1 M R, which is actually isomorphic to the symplectic group S P 2 G Z. Because, because curves go to curves, so it's integral. There is a little point, which is I don't want to consider this whole representation because it's, not, it's reducible. Uh, why it's reducible? Because you can take, for each square of your surface, you can take this cycle here. So for each square uh, j, you can take this cycle, which is relative. You can take this vertical cycle here. And if you add up over all squares, sigma g, and if you add up all squares, I mean this zeta g, then you get two cycles. And basically, the action of the matrix on these cycles is this matrix itself. So what I'm saying is that if you take a matrix here, A in SL and omega, which is A, B, C, D, then the action of this matrix in homology restricted to this plane is represented on this basis by A, B, C, D. So this is what people call the tautological plane. So we, which is a plane which is always there. We understand the action. It's the matrix itself. So for the purpose of doing interesting things, we are going to discard this plane. How? You, you can take it out by taking the symplectic orthogonal. So you take x and omega. The representation going from S, L, M, omega to the endomorphisms of the plane spanned by this guy, perp, where this perp is with respect to symplectic form, I mean, the intersection form. <coughs> okay, so this is a vector space of dimension uh, 2G minus 2. You took out a plane. And this plane is symplectic. You can see here the intersections. OK, so this is the representation. And the concept of monodromy is the image of this, of this group by this representation. So KZ monodromy is the image under rho of the Vich group. This is KZ M omega. And now you know that, um, so this is the group that I want to study. This is the monodromy. And now I'm back to Sarnak's question. So Sarnak's question is, how often this group is thin or not? And this is what I'm going to discuss now. So after this background. So I don't know how much time I have. Because my clock. OK. Because <laughs> my clock is broken, so I don't know how I can't control. You might do a break like in 15 minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so basically, uh, this is the group that I want to study. And I want to know how often this group is arithmetic or not. So let me start with uh, things which were known. Uh, so first thing is, is a remark, which is due to Martin Muller. Uh, but actually, uh, yeah, so let me put it uh, uh, in parentheses because he's not proud of this thing because it's a very simple remark. So he does not want people to quote as a result of Martin Muller, because it's very simple. But the point is that uh, kz and omega is always arithmetic in genus 2. I mean, genus 2 is the genus of uh, m omega. <coughs> Why? Uh, the argument uses a uh, period map. <clears throat> Basically, what happens is that if you, instead of the homology or cohomology, I don't know, which has dimension 4, 
you look at the Jacobian, you can look at this tautological plane and the complement. Both are of dimension two. Uh, so you have these two things inside the Jacobian, and you have a natural map, which is holomorphic. And uh, since the exponents are non-zero, this was proved by Bainbridge, a student of Macmillan. This is a holomorphic non-constant map. And you know that in the first coordinate, it's the tautological plane, and this guy has finite index. So it's a, a surface of finite area. So you have a, a surface admitting a holomorphic non-constant map from a surface of finite area to it. So it should have finite area. <coughs> I don't know if it's clear, but uh, I'm going to give this as a hint. Uh, since I met in Russian, the Russian students are very strong. I think these two words suffice to reconstruct the argument. Uh, yeah, so use period maps. So the, the question is really interesting. Uh, what happens uh, in genus 3? <coughs> because now in genus 3, you don't have this uh, argument. I mean, you have a, a something of a billion variety of dimension 4 sitting on this big thing of dimension 6, so you don't have this easy maps. And so this question is uh, what I'm going to try to try to answer. So the first remark I should make is the following. Um, this group, this concept of monodromy, is usually, I'm not going to define what this word means, usually uh, Zariski dance. You should remember that in the definition of fin, fin, uh, fin or arithmetic groups, I was always asking a priori the group to be Zariski dense. And uh, I'm claiming that this is usually the case. You don't, usually you don't have to care about that. Why? Because there are criteria for, to, to check. I mean, uh, uh, you can use, you can use uh, uh, several uh, criteria for Zariski denseness in the literature. So in this case, you might be interested in using a criterion by, I mean, uh, <coughs> in a paper that I wrote with Martin Muller and uh, Yokos, which gives, uh, basically, if you have two matrices in this group, which are what we like to call Galois pinching, uh, and they don't commute, then you can use this result and a paper by Prasad and Hapinchuk to get the risky denseness. So it's not very hard to apply, and we are going to, yeah. So usually, the first part of the definition, we don't have to care. I mean, these monodromies, they are already sitting in the integral points of some semi-simple group, so that's okay, and usually they are the risky dense. So the question is really, what is, what is the index? <coughs> in uh, sp to g minus 2z. I forgot to say, but this definition, I mean, since you are squared tile, this decomposition is defined over q, which is not generally the case. But uh, here it is. OK. <coughs> um, very nice. So now I'm going to talk uh, about uh, my, uh, maybe I can make a break now and then talk about um, what I did with Pascal. Because I mean, Pascal and I started here. Basically, we took at this situation and then we were trying to, I mean, we, we, we are still trying to figure out. And what I'm going to tell you is a very partial result based on a attempted which failed to show that uh, the monodromy of a certain origami is thin. So let, let, yeah, it's a good point to make a break and uh, I can get back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so before I continue into genus 3, uh, maybe I'll do something uh, <coughs> which is already on the blackboard. So I, I think I'll do uh, this calculation again, but uh, in slow motion. So, because this is important, I mean, understand this construction, which actually goes back to Thurston and Vich. So I should put the names here Thurston and Vich. It, it's important. Uh, for the sequel, I mean, I, I actually, I, what I'm going to say is, I'm going to give answers to the calculations, but the idea to compute is always reproducing this idea ever and ever. I mean, so the idea is the following: 
Uh, the first thing is you have to understand is uh, the, what the dent twist is doing. I mean, this is very basic. So what I'm doing first is I'm going to detach <coughs> uh, these two cylinders. So you see that in the surface, <coughs> there are two uh, what people call horizontal cylinders. So on this surface, there, is a, there are uh, these points. Which are the conic which is the conical singularity of this guy? I mean, all these points are identified together to the same point here. So actually, if you do the exercise of gluing this thing and trying to glue the other piece, you get something like that. You get first a torus, and then there is a point, and you get uh, something like that. <coughs> um, <coughs> so you, you have this picture. And now I'm going to apply uh, this matrix uh, to each piece and then see what happens. So in the first piece, since it's uh, two by one, I mean my squares have size one. So this, so this guy here is going to be slanted <coughs> like that. And then you see that if you cut here and paste back, you get the same surface, I mean the same cylinder, with the same boundaries. And the only thing which happened of bizarre is the following, so that I need my colors. So. <coughs> is that here you had a cycle which is horizontal, and then you have these two uh, vertical cycles here. And this is a piece of the one which is going up. And then uh, those guys are doing that. And then what you see is that uh, when you cut and paste, uh, these paths are doing this thing. So. Right? And so in homology, this means that I'm sending this guy here, which is sigma 0, to this uh, curve. So let me put more emphasis. emphasis. And this curve in homology is just trying to go up and doing this thing. So this is why I wrote that the image of this cycle by this matrix is uh, this guy plus this guy, which is uh, sigma 1. So this is how you find the formula. And similarly for the other cycles. I mean, this square here, if you apply this matrix, then you should slant it twice. And then you can go and paste. And so you see that you are going twice this thing. And so this is how you get these formulas. <coughs> and if you use these formulas, uh, actually, so this is uh, the formula that you get for this choice of basis. But I was talking before about this tautological plane. So what is the tautological plane? It's just summing up the bottoms of uh, the squares, which is just doing sigma 0 plus uh, sigma 1. So this is the side that I call it sigma. Similarly for zeta, so it's zeta 0 plus zeta 1. And if you look at these formulas, <coughs> and you let A act on these cycles, you see that uh, sigmas are going to the sum, so sigma is going to sigma. And zeta is going to, well, I'm first writing the sum, so it's zeta 0 plus zeta 1 plus 2 sigma 1 plus 2 sigma 0. And here you recognize that uh, it's uh, zeta plus 2 sigma. And if you put this action on the basis, the matrix, is uh, this is fixed, so 1, 0. And then it's uh, 2, 1. I don't know, so maybe it's two mm -hmm. So this matrix 1, 2, or 0, 1, uh, it's, uh, yeah, so it's ideal. <laughs> the vector is a stable vector, it's the first one. 
Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, actually, the choice of this guy was made so that when I do the matrix, I can cut and paste and get the same cylinder. So, so this is why I put two, not one. I mean, if I did this tilt just once, it does not work. No, it's, it's okay. It's good. It's okay. But the question is, it has the order of, of, of waste. Uh, so is it okay? It, it, Ah, the other, yeah, the other basis is uh, arbitrary, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just took two horizontal sides and two vertical. No, I mean, but uh, is your vector, uh, is your first vector uh, sigma, or your first vector is uh, rho? Which is the first vector? Uh, actually, for, for this choice here, I'm just putting sigma and rho. Ah, so it's yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, and this basis here, yeah, usually I like to note, uh, yeah, so sigma, okay, so uh, rho, and then, the exactly. Okay. Okay, um, yeah, so, so this is how you get these matrices. I mean, so as you can see, this is very concrete once you get uh, to the point of understanding what is this cutting and pacing are doing. I mean, it, it, it's really producing matrices. It's not uh, something very abstract. I mean, of course, there is abstract theory because this, this representation <coughs> comes from variations of other structures. But concretely, it's simply this, I mean, uh, you are doing something to the surface when you move in the modular space, and they want to keep track of what, what's happening to a certain base of homology. So we are following the integral points on the, the thing. So this is really Gauss Manning. <coughs> okay, so let's go to the genus three. So let me tell you about uh, uh, <coughs> the failed attempt to get thin groups. So let me call it failed attempt. to obtain fin KZ monodromies. <coughs> so the first remark is the following. <coughs> if, and this is a big if, this representation is faithful, so injective, <coughs> And SL M omega is virtually free, which is which is the case of say SL, uh, which is the case of this L. I mean, uh, it's the gamma two, so it contains gamma two, so it's free. <coughs> so free model of finite index. Yeah, but I'm saying if uh, faithful. Okay. Which is not trivial. So faithful is injective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know that this thing. Uh, then uh, the image of this guy, so the, the concept of origin monodromy, <coughs> is uh, fin. If faithful, blah blah blah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm always assuming. I mean, this business. That I'm already risk this. And genus is. Uh, and genus at least three. Yeah. If ta ta. Uh, yeah. So here genus is at least three. <coughs> okay. And the, why this is so? It's because of uh, Kajdan property T. By Kajdan. Property T. <coughs> what I mean is the following. If this guy had finite index in the corresponding symplectic group, so it would be a symplectic group, so this is a subgroup of SP uh, 2G minus 2Z. And this guy is at least four, so it's higher rank. Mm -hmm. So you have a higher rank group, and you have a finite index guy, so this guy has property T, because this guy has property T, and property T is hereditary. Mm -hmm. uh, but three groups don't have uh, this guy. Did this property, and so this representation can't be faithful. <coughs> there should be some kernel. Okay, so it's simply the remark that I mean this group here is virtually free, so it can't have a property T, and this guy here is if it's a finite index of this guy, it has property T by higher rank. <coughs> and so you know that I mean uh, this is a, a certificate for finesse. 
And so this is the starting point of uh, this work. We were trying to use, apply this criteria. So we were trying hard to find examples where this representation is faithful. So we were playing with computers and trying to test many uh, square tile surfaces. Uh, yeah, exactly. We don't need faithful, yeah, but uh, simply, uh, yeah, I agree. I totally agree. And then uh, what we did with Pascal was the following. Um, <clears throat> the first thing we ruled out was, uh, so first remark is that uh, we don't want to consider n omegas uh, with one cylinder decompositions. So in other words, we don't want to take square tile surface so that when you apply SL2Z, you find in this orbit of SL2Z surfaces which have just one cylinder like that. Okay, which is just a pile of squares and glued in some ways. <clears throat> the boundaries are glued in some ways. Say like that. We don't want to do that. Why? <clears throat> it's because if you see this guy, then the matrix, uh, which is 1k, 0, 1, 4k being the modulus of the cylinder, uh, it acts, so the action of this thing on the complement of the tautological plane is the identity. Because you are always adding the same cycle to everybody. So if you kill the autonomy, you can check that this is identity. So in other words, you got many, many elements in the kernel. And so this is bad for you. <clears throat> and so we don't want that. And so the first thing we did was we put on the computers. There is a, a, nice, a very nice program uh, called Sage. <clears throat> and in Sage, you, can, you have a package uh, which uh, contains programs written by Anton Zorich and Vincent Lecroix, among others, which allows you to compute many, 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 many properties about square tile surfaces. <clears throat> the point is that you can give square tile surfaces to computers by giving pairs of permutations, because uh, if you give me a square tile surface, I can put numbers on these squares and then say <clears throat> one permutation tells who is the neighbor to the right, so one, the neighbor to the right is one itself. The neighbor of two is three, and the neighbor of three is two. So this is a, in cycle notation. And another permutation is just who is on the top. So on the top of one, we find two. And on the top of two is one, <clears throat> and then three goes by itself. So in other words, to give a square tile surface, you give a pair of permutations, and computers can handle permutations. So, so this is how you get a lot of information. And then, <clears throat> yeah, so, so this is how you get uh, group theory, I mean, finite group theory, I mean, theory of finite groups in this business. But this is an aside. So <clears throat> uh, after uh, asking uh, Sage uh, and Vincent, uh, one realizes that there is a beautiful origami, so this, which is this one. Uh, let me do a drawing. So uh, and then sides are this one with uh, this, and then two, and then x. V, V, I, V, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it's a square tile surface with nine squares. It lives on H one one one, so the principal stratum. <coughs> so what I mean is there are four zeros for the pullback of DZ, four conical singularities <coughs> of. Uh, which are simple. And this guy uh, has uh, three 
cylinders in every rational direction. <clears throat> so in other words, if you start uh, looking at the diagonal direction and you decompose the surface into cylinders, you find three. If you do any rational direction, you always find three cylinders. So you never see this kind of picture in particular. And so this is a, a good guy, I mean, a good candidate for this faithfulness property. I mean, at least there is no obvious obstruction. <clears throat> and so at this point, one is happy. So the question is, uh, mystery, is this, uh, is the corresponding monodromy fin? So the question is, uh, if you can show that uh, this monodromy is fin. <clears throat> Actually, I call it KZ, KZ01 fin in SP4R. <coughs> and then uh, the answer is the following. So basically what, what you need to do is, the first you need to understand what is the Vich group. And the Vich group of this guy is very simple. There is only one cusp. So SL01. It's a free product of two cyclic groups. <clears throat> so actually, the matrices are uh, 0 minus 1, uh, 1 minus 1, and uh, 1 minus 3, 1 minus 2. <clears throat> so it's not very different from SL2Z. I mean, SL2Z is the free product of Z2 and Z3. This is just uh, three, two elements of order 3. Let me call them A and B. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is finite index. Yeah, uh, I, the index is four. Yeah, so actually, the, the picture is the following. Uh, you have this O1. So in terms of the standard generators of SL2Z, I mean, standard, the, the parabolics, if you apply one of them, so it's kind of funny, the diagram. So I, I like a lot this example because uh, the picture is the following. If you start applying the matrix 1, 1, one, 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 zero, one you start building uh, origamis like that. Oh, yeah, so actually, I'm sorry. Yeah. It should be, yeah. Yeah, so you go by, by t in this way. And if you apply the other parabolic, you go that way. So on the, the, on the external ring, you go this way. In the other, you go that way. So it's a very symmetric uh, group. So it's, you know, I find it kind of nice. <coughs> and, and this is, and, and and actually by drawing the surfaces, you realize that there is no decomposition in less than three cylinders. Because this is, I mean, but changing the direction is equivalent to uh, applying a matrix to make this direction horizontal and look at the resulting surface. So there is a duality between directions and the the action of these matrices. <clears throat> and, then, and, and then it's fast to check these elements here. <clears throat> OK. Um, so now uh, we are happy because uh, we have a representation I mean, of a group which is just a free product. So we, not, we need just to compute two matrices, the image of A and B. And uh, we did that. So the answer is the following. If you choose a nice basis in homology, uh, the answer is that the image of the first matrix is uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, pa, 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 minus 1, minus 1, 1, 0. This has other three, by the way. So it's coherent, at least. <clears throat> and uh, this guy here is similar, but uh, changing the, the, somehow changing the, the Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so, so these are the two matrices that you have to understand. And so you want to understand what is the group generated by these two matrices in SP4? What is the index? And this is a not so easy decision problem. <clears throat> so you want to. So suppose I have P5. 
you know, for small groups. Yeah, you can test. Yeah, so basically, I'm going. Yeah, I'm going to give you the answer. Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, so basically, when we got to this point, uh, we did the following. So let's try to prove that this thing is uh, uh, faithful by playing ping pong. So we looked for the compositions of uh, the projective space of R4, trying to play ping pong because it's a certificate for Finis. It's it failed. Then we try to uh, do products of, uh, <coughs> I mean, try to find relations. <laughs> and actually, it was funny because uh, we tested these matrices. I mean, we tested uh, power, so we tested uh, after uh, testing all uh, words on A and B of length. At, at most century, and some of length 24, with some, uh, we found no relations. <coughs> but then <coughs> there is this nice site, website, MetaOverflow, that you can pose, ask, uh, pose questions. And uh, when I posted this question on MetaOverflow, uh, there is a German uh, mathematician, uh, Stephen Kohl, which use it gap to test really I mean make more serious tests and really really he showed that uh, actually a row is not a fit because there is a nice word so it's a b a inverse b a inverse b a b inverse to the power three so it's a word of length twenty four this is a dead end see four by four. And if you don't like uh, this presentation, I can give you the SL2R. It's a minus <coughs> and this is the smallest relation. Which of course had the determinant one. <laughs> okay. Uh, so he, here's the answer. So rho is not faithful. And there is a nice reason for this uh, failure. Also, which is the theorem by myself and Pascal, well, Pascal and myself. Uh, row 01, uh, KZ01 is arithmetic. So this is why, <laughs> so once we got to this point, I mean, we realized that we should not insist on that, but how to try to prove that and we manage. So I'm going to explain how. <clears throat> so how do you prove this thing? Um, <clears throat> there is a nice criterion for, a uh, very recent criterion for arithmetic, <clears throat> which was conjectured by Margulis, who was solved in some cases by uh, Venkataramana, Hagunathan, Hio, and recently, I mean, the final piece of uh, work was by Benoit and uh, Mikel. It's the following. <coughs> so, arithmetic criterion of Benoit Mikel. which is the former uh, Margulis conjecture. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to give the, the criteria in general. I'm just going to give the what we need for SP4. But of course, I mean, you, you understand that there are there is a general version about semi-simple Lie groups, blah, blah. <clears throat> yeah, so the criteria is the first. So let me not try to, yeah, let me try to not forget uh, Hypothesis. So I have gamma inside SP uh, four Z, uh, which is Ariski dense in SP four R. So this is one thing. 
Uh, the other thing is that uh, gamma intersects the unipotent radical radical of uh, some non-trivial parabolic, non-trivial <coughs> parabolic in a lattice. Uh, then uh, you are arithmetic. So in other words, <coughs> if you if you have a Zariski dense guy, which intersects in a lattice, some group of uh, block triangular matrices, then you won. You can complete the opposite parabolic somehow. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Exactly. Exactly, precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and basically, I mean, this was over in many cases. So for instance, when you already know <coughs> that this group is in the integral points of the group, then this was uh, Venkataraman and Hagunathan. And the general case, when you are not a priori inside the group in, in this, in the integral points, you have to work a little more. And this was Rio's thesis for many cases, and uh, Benoit Michel for all cases. <coughs> So basically, the, the missing cases were, I mean, there is an important missing case, which was the product of SL2 with SL2, which was dealt with by Selberg. And uh, they took the ideas of Selberg and completed the, yeah. So if you want to see this, a detailed version of this result, you can go uh, for the video section of uh, the Fields Institute. Uh, if Benoit gave a very nice mini course on that uh, during the Tashimula program, uh, last uh, August at Fields Institute. So the videos are there, and he explains very well. So you are surely going to have fun to look at this mini course. <coughs> OK, so we are going to use that in the case of uh, uh, the following flag. So basically, what is the idea? The idea is that when you apply these uh, <coughs> matrices, I mean, when, when you apply uh, these then twists, there is an obvious fixed vector, which is the core curves of the cylinders. So basically, when you apply these guys, you always find um, a vector which is fixed. <coughs> exactly. And, and then, yeah, and, and, yeah, exactly. And then, I mean, w once you find f vectors which are fixed by some matrices, actually, since it's symplectic, uh, it should fix the space which is the perpendicular, which uh, here is dimension three because we're in dimension four. And then you have the full vector space. And so this is, this is going to be my flag, my, my non-trivial parabolic. And then I want to be identity on the quotients of this thing to be in the nipotent radical. So what I'm going to do is uh, to show you matrices. So basically, then this was the, the blind part of, I mean, the part where you don't think you compute, like the Italians like to say. So you see this result. You don't think you compute. So and you compute by the following. Uh, first, uh, for some reason, with, with respect to the base matrices that I gave you, I'm going to change bases again. <laughs> so there is a, a matrix. So I'm going just to permute the, the, the second and just to put in the position of the flag, basically. So I'm going to permute those two guys. So I'm introducing this permutation matrix. So this is technical. It's just to make the results that I'm going to stay true. <coughs> So I'm permuting the, the, the second and fourth vectors. And then if you compute the, the matrix X, so which is after changing basis, A square B e square, A B square square P, you take Y to be P A B A square B A A B e square square p and z equals to p a2 b a2 b2 a b p so i'm just putting this matrix in a new basis then you can check that uh, uh, the commutator of y and x so commutator from me is in this order is the following matrix is one 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 zero one 
and then a 0, 0, 18. X to the power 6 commutator is 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, 18, 18, 0, 0. And Z to the power 6, X to the power 6 commutator YX inverse is uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 18, 0, 0, 0. And if you do that, you recognize in this piece here uh, the roots associated to the nilpotent part of this flag. And so you want, I mean, intersected with Alaris, which is basically a copy of 18 times E3 inside the unipotent radical. So it's a lattice. <coughs> I mean, interse you intersect all roots. I mean, all, all a multiple, I mean, which is 18, of all positive roots. So you have a lattice in your unipotent group. And so you can apply Benoit Michel and conclude. And of course, I mean, the, the <coughs> so this is the failed attempt, which actually turned out to be arithmetic. And if you ask Pascal and me, I mean, basically, we have the feeling that uh, in this setting of concerns or monodromies, um, the monodromy should be, in most cases, uh, arithmetic. I mean, now we think that uh, the, the presence of this variation of all structure and the, all these structures which are here for somehow this monodromy is to be arithmetic. But of course, you don't have a proof. I mean, you have an example where you have these formulas which work, but uh, Trying to generalize this for infinite families, for instance, is a very interesting question. And uh, I think that's it. I mean, I have nothing more to say. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be a nice question. Yeah, so it should be, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's for, yeah. And we don't know, yeah. So, so the, yeah, so this is one example pointing to many, many more questions. So. I guess we are far from answering Sarnak's initial question to asking, but at least we have an example, I mean, which almost worked, but yeah. Uh, the second uh, condition from uh, the law that we get, gamma contains impotent uh, radical? Uh, yeah, yeah, so gamma, when you intersect with the unipotent radical, oh, okay. it, it's a lattice in the unipotent radical, oh. yeah. No, yeah, so basically, I mean, so in, this, in terms of this flag, what this means, I mean, the unipotent radical should be the identity on the quotient. So if you put the three first vectors to generate this flag, then you want to be identity here. Uh, well, identity here. And then you can put anything else um, in a, you wish. Uh, no. Uh, well, what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah. So basically, you should complete with a parabolic, except that uh, in this guy, since you are symplectic, I mean, it's not the full triangular. I mean, there is a relation between the root. Yeah. So this is this uh, 1818 that you see here. Comes from symplecticity. I mean, when you write the symplectic form in this guy, you get this. <coughs> yeah. So actually, there, the intersection of this with the symplectic, you get only um, three roots instead of the usual five that should be. It dimension, yeah. <coughs> yeah, but, this, but actually there is a lot of choice. I mean, uh, you can choose any. So th this is the power of this criteria. I mean, you can choose any flag you want. In this case, I mean, you are not taking the full flag. That, that's a one point. You are not taking the R, R2, R3, R4. You are just taking the partial flag. And it's already, I mean, and the intersect a, a, a lattice in this small uh, part and it's already sufficient to recover a full lattice, so it's kind of funny this technology. <coughs> but the roads are touching like, at least one of the supervisor. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 at, at least one element you get, yeah. You get. At least one you get for uh, dent waste reasons. You can always, f for geometric reasons, build one element, I mean, but building two and playing with commutators is already tricky, yeah. That's right. <coughs> 